All right. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, so as Chris uh, mentioned, today we're going to go over the tick stack and kind of influx enterprise. So uh, we're going to you know, talk about what uh, influx enterprise is, what influx cloud is, what the tick stack is, uh, you know, how you determine which one of them uh, is going to suit your needs. And then we're going to get into what an influx DB cluster is. So uh, in the clustering is a part of influx enterprise. We'll make the distinction between the two. Uh, in the process, we'll talk a little bit about uh, meta nodes and data nodes and, you know, how all these things kind of come together. We'll go briefly over what kind of hardware you should actually run a cluster on and, you know, some, some minimum requirements that we set there. Uh, and then finally, we'll do a short demo of an installation uh, of Influx Enterprise. So, uh, just in case uh, you don't know, what is Influx Data? Influx Data is a modern engine for metrics and events. Uh, and this kind of came down or what it came out of, you know, uh, some new workload requirements that we started noticing, which is, you know, there's sensors on everything. We want to monitor everything. Uh, and so we, we need kind of a, a new system to deal with these high volume writes. And um, we wanted something that could handle both regular and irregular data, so events versus metrics. Uh, and we wanted a lot of logic about data retention, particularly based off of time. Uh, we also wanted to have time-based queries, so, you know, give me the average over the last day, uh, things like this. And then we wanted something that was, you know, scalable and available. Uh, so, you know, uh, available in some sort of clustered fashion, not just a, a sort of uh, federated thing where you have to do a bunch of work to, to have uh, some high availability. <clears throat> Influx Data has three product offerings. Uh, there is Influx Cloud, which is a hosted version of Influx Enterprise. Uh, so the main idea here is it's all of the enterprise features, uh, and we'll talk about what those are in just a moment, uh, except we will host the instance for you. There's Influx Enterprise if you want to run that, what we have in our cloud in your, uh, in your own uh, uh, hardware on, on premises. And then finally, if you're sort of just getting started or, or you know, uh, you, you've already have something built out, you can use just the tick stack, which is 100% open source. So this brings me to the question here, which is, what is Influx Enterprise? Uh, so Influx Enterprise is the full sort of Influx data tick stack. So you get Telegraph, you get Influx DB, you get Chronograph, and you get Capacitor. Uh, but where there's some additional features, uh, additional features, namely that you get a high availability of each of the components of the tick stack. So you can get a highly available version of Influx DB or Capacitor, uh, Chronograph uh, soon enough. So you get kind of this, this whole high availability thing uh, and then kind of be possible to have uh, something that is a little bit more sort of scale out performance. You get more sort of uh, cluster management tools that come along with Chronograph. So Chronograph can know if you are using Influx Enterprise and we can see that these features are available and you kind of just get to use them out of the box. You have more uh, advanced backup and control uh, scenarios or, or procedures uh, and you get sort of uh, access control. So you can do things like uh, restrict which users can see which types of information, make read or write only uh, type uh, users to, to the things in the database. So those are sort of the, the distinction between, you know, uh, open source and an enterprise. Enterprise is really just clustering, so high availability and scalability, uh, and advanced sort of management features uh, that, that are sort of nice in some sort of enterprise context. Now, Influx Cloud is the entire Influx Enterprise to features, but packaged together as a service that you can purchase that you don't have to host yourself. It's just an endpoint that you call uh, call out to. So just to give you a little bit sort of a uh, different representation of, of what it is that we offer. It's just kind of the way we think about, you know, what influx data and the tick stack is, is a way you can accumulate data, analyze data, and take actions on data. 
So, you know, there, there's not plenty of things you can get in there. You get data normalization, correlation of various thing, data points, you know, pattern matching, uh, you know, time series functions over, over some time ranges and anomaly detection that are really allow you to sort of take massive amounts of data and sort of do something with them or visualize it or act on it. Uh, and just to give you the sort of final, uh, you know, sort of distinction between what is open source and what is closed source. Open source core is Telegraph, InfluxDB, Chronograph, and Capacitor, the sort of baseline versions of them. And then you have the enterprise features, which are clustering, access control, high availability, uh, and, and some other security features. <clears throat> So now we're going to talk a little bit about the Influx Enterprise architecture, uh, and an Influx Enterprise installation consists of you know three separate software sort of processes. You can also throw a capacitor or, uh, in here as well, uh, though the the uh, enterprise version of capacitor is still kind of in, in its works at the moment. Uh, but to have an enterprise installation, what you would do is uh, get some meta nodes, or sorry, data nodes, which are, are nodes that store the actual time series data. You have meta nodes that keep kind of some state consistent across the cluster. Uh, and then you have chronograph, which you use kind of as the UI layer uh, to your cluster. And so to run an InfluxDB cluster, all you really need is, you know, the meta and data nodes. Uh, and and you, that way you wouldn't have the entire sort of feature suite necessarily available to you, just the scaling uh, in clustering. So meta nodes uh, are nodes that keep state consistent, meta state consistent across the cluster. Uh, and so things that we store in, in a meta state are things like the users, the databases, the continuous queries, the retention policies, the shard locations, uh, servers, and, and, and whatnot. So uh, the important thing to, to make a note of here is that the meta nodes do not actually store any time series data. They just store the extra information that needs to be uh, in a strongly consistent state across the cluster. So what do I mean by strongly consistent? I mean that you could query any one of the meta nodes in your cluster and you would get the exact same response. So if I say, you know, show users or show databases or show continuous queries, every single meta node would give you the exact same answer. Uh, the same thing would not be true for the data nodes. The data nodes are, are in a eventually consistent state, so it is possible to query two separate data nodes and get slightly different answers. <clears throat> uh, in order to have a highly available cluster, uh, you must have at least three meta nodes. And then a small little note that I make here is uh, you meta nodes don't typically need a large number of resources. We'll talk about you know, what kind of resources you, you can anticipate uh, in, in more detail in, in just a moment. So the next type of nodes that there are are data nodes. Uh, data nodes store the actual time series data. So the measurements and fields and tags, all of that is actually stored on the data nodes. Uh, and data nodes are actually the nodes that respond to and receive queries. And so uh, they don't participate in, in sort of this strong consensus for things like users and continuous queries. Uh, if they ever have to interact with that kind of information, they'll call out to the meta service. Uh, in order to have a highly available cluster, you must have at least two data nodes. Uh, and typically data nodes do uh, need a large number of resources. So this is where you want to put your, you know, uh, thousand IOP SSDs and, you know, your, your 30 gigs of RAM or, you know, 128 gigs of RAM, 16 cores. These are the nodes that you really want to, to put that type of processing onto. Finally, uh, the like, last piece that sort of comes into play here is chronograph. And chronograph is used to do kind of user management. It also has a number of kind of pre-built dashboards. Uh, you can do some custom dashboarding, you can do database management and retention policy management, and, you know, just all the kind of UI features that you would want out of a cluster. Uh, you can do all of that through Chronograph. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, the, the uh, Chronograph can detect if you're using an enterprise version of the software uh, and appropriately, you know, uh, unlock a certain number of features that may not have 
previously been available to you. So the final step in a sort of complete enterprise uh, influx enterprise installation is a influx enterprise monitor or something that is actually monitoring your influx enterprise cluster. And so we have this little bit of a visualization off to the right here uh, where you have your meta nodes, your data nodes, uh, you have telegraph on each of those nodes, uh, and then a, a separate influx DB instance that is consuming that data. And you know maybe a chronograph or, or a telegraph or, or a capacitor sort of hooked up to that, alerting you to let you know if there's anything wrong with the cluster itself. So the idea here is you have a separate influx DB instance, telegraphs all reporting to that step on each of the nodes in your cluster, uh, all of them reporting to uh, that influx DB instance, and then maybe you know chronograph to to do some visualization or dashboarding uh, of that. Uh, instance. And this is, is something that we strongly recommend for any uh, enterprise, influx enterprise installation, uh, just so you have something monitoring the thing that is monitoring uh, your cluster. So uh, we got a question in the Q&A, which is, can you quick give a quick explanation of Telegraph? Yeah, so Telegraph is our uh, metrics collector. So it's the way that you kind of generate data. So there's there's two main fashions that you can operate Telegraph in is you can put it on every node in your cluster or every node in your uh, server farm and have it report things like the amount of memory that it's being used, the amount of disk that is being used, the amount of CPU that is being used. Uh, it'll report all of that information back to uh, your cluster where you can sort of monitor uh, each of the, the nodes in the, in the cluster independently. Uh, and that's one way you can use it. The other way you can use it is to monitor things like monitor uh, your, your <clears throat> MongoDB instance or your, your Postgres instance and have it collect some statistics about that and write it into InfluxDB. Uh, so like a system monitoring agent, exactly. So it's, it's much like CollectD uh, is, is a similar kind of analogy that uh, it could draw to. So uh, some general cluster advice is you want to put a load balancer in front of your data nodes so that queries are spread and, and writes are spread across uh, each of the nodes in the cluster. Uh, and we're going to talk about higher replication factors and, and how that comes into play in just a moment. Uh, and as I was saying, you know, there's, there's some general hardware recommendations that we can have, you know, just, just high level recommendations. If you are going to be operating a um, interplucked enterprise cluster, you want to have a good experience, your data nodes should really have a minimum of four CPU cores, uh, preferably eight, uh, but, but four is, is probably sufficient. Uh, and you want to have a minimum of 16 gigabytes of RAM. And the reason for that is, you know, you just want to give yourself enough operating capacity to, to really grow into your, your cluster. Uh, you know, you could probably operate with less RAM. Uh, it's just in the past that we've observed that things typically work the best uh, when you have a little bit more RAM. And then for meta nodes, you really don't need that many resources. Uh, in, in fact, you can just have one CPU core and two gigs of RAM is, is more than sufficient. Uh, and the important thing to note here is that you need to have an odd number of meta nodes. So the particular uh, consensus algorithm that the meta nodes use uh, is raft and raft relies on there being an odd number of uh, raft peers. And so uh, another thing to, to make a note of here is at influx data we don't charge or, or the pricing is not reflected on the number of meta nodes that you have but rather the number uh, of data nodes that you have and sort of how large uh, those data nodes are. Uh, so if you do have more questions about, uh, you know, uh, data nodes and pricing, please reach out to our uh, sales team. I'm sure they'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you have. So the next thing I'd like to talk about very briefly uh, is I'm going to be trying to work to uh, replication factors or how many copies of data exist in the cluster. Uh, but to get there, I want to talk briefly about shards, technically shard groups. So in InfluxDB, uh, all data in the database is sharded by time. So the reason why we do this is that uh, we can very easily expire blocks of time. It's just removing a file on disk. 
So if you want to say, get rid of any data that's older than a month, uh, it's very easy to do that. Uh, so uh, all the data is sharded up into time uh, and <clears throat> uh, we kind of get to this, this replication factor, which is, you know, how many copies of a particular shard should exist in a cluster. So if you want to have some sort of uh, resiliency to say a node going down, uh, you want to have a very high replication factor. So your replication factor can never be higher than the number of data nodes in the cluster. So if I have a two data node cluster, like I do in this example here, uh, the highest replication factor I can have is two. And having a replication factor of two simply means that uh, there are two copies of that shard uh, in the cluster. So uh, in this example here, we can see that shard one uh, exists on both data node one and data node two. Now, this is the contrast to this with I could have a replication factor of one, uh, in which case there would only ever be one copy of a shard in a cluster. Uh, to make things a little bit more resilient, we, we do actually do uh, fragment uh, shards up a bit more. So uh, if you happen to lose a node, you don't lose all of the data that is uh, for a particular time range. You just lose some of it uh, just based off of how we, we split things up in the cluster. So uh, there is some things to kind of keep in mind about replication factors. And let me make sure I have a slide. I do have a slide about that. Uh, so how do you utilize replication factors? How do I monitor or, or create a retention policy that has a replication factor? Uh, so you can do it in kind of two ways. You can, uh, when you go to create a new database, you can say create database MyDB with replication and give the replication that you'd like to have. Or alternatively, you can say, create retention policy MyRP on MyDB with some duration, and then the replication that you'd like to have. You could actually get a little bit more, uh, if suppose you already had a database and you want to modify the replication factor, you could do that as well uh, by issuing an alter uh, retention policy command. Uh, if, if that interests you, I'd recommend checking out the documentation. So one thing to keep in mind uh, is that higher replication factors will result in lower query latency, but higher write latency. So uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of sort of reason about this is uh, when I'm writing a data, when I'm writing data, if I have a high replication factor, meaning that all nodes must receive all of the data, uh, you're basically doing write amplification. Right, it's you know, right to one location. It has to write to all the other nodes in the cluster, and so this this kind of just you know increases the uh, amount of time that any one write will uh, take place. There's some things you can do to control the level of guarantee uh, of the request. So uh, if I'd like to have it verified that every that data point was written to each of the data nodes. I can uh, issue a write query with a consistency all, uh, and that will make sure that each node uh, has accepted the write before returning a uh, accepted write to the client. Or if I can, you know, be a little bit more lax with things, there's things like consistency any or consistency one uh, or, or quorum, where maybe a majority of the nodes need to acknowledge a write before it is accepted. So the that's typically that's why uh, you know, having a higher replication factor will probably decrease the write throughput of your cluster. So if you do have a very, very performance critical uh, instance, having uh, everything kind of, having a higher replication factor will lower your write latency. And, you know, what do I mean by lower? Uh, it, it's definitely not an order of magnitude, I would say. So an OSS instance could probably take on the order of 700,000 writes a second. Uh, if you had a replication factor of two uh, in a data node, uh, in a cluster with two data nodes, I would say that you might see that drop to something, uh, let me say like 450,000 rather than that, that 700,000 that, that I previously stated. <clears throat> Whereas if you had singly replicated, it would probably be around that 750,000, possibly even higher. So uh, to contrast that, you know, why would anybody ever want to do that then? You know, you get higher resiliency, uh, but you also get the added benefit of more data nodes in the cluster can respond to a query. 
So if I have, say, 100 users that are all querying the database, uh, being able to spread that load across two data nodes or three data nodes or four, whatever it be, and have each of them respond to queries independently, uh, that's super beneficial just because uh, it doesn't need to call out to the other system and it can handle all of the, the load that's coming from uh, they, it's just sort of you have more resources to to fill queries. So uh, higher retent replication factors, lower query latency, but increased write latency. It's the sort of moral of the story here. So uh, here we're going to have sort of a sort of quick walkthrough of how to set up a two data node cluster. Uh, just going to do a high level sort of overview, and then I'm going to you know switch into a screen share. Uh, and just kind of go through the process of setting one up myself. My hope is that uh, nothing will go wrong. Uh, I've kind of staged some instances a little bit, but I haven't actually uh, gone through and, and run things to make sure they work uh, correctly. Yeah, things typically work correctly, but you know, whenever you're, you're doing things on the fly, there's always a possibility that something could go wrong. So we're going to hope that, that nothing goes wrong uh, today. So the, the process that you go through to set up a two data node cluster is to first and foremost, go get a license key. So a license key, you can get a, a two week, I believe, uh, free trial, which we can extend you know, based off of circumstances, uh, where you can test out a cluster and sort of get a feel for the experience uh, and work with the tool before, say, moving on or in the sales process. So uh, you can do that by going through our portal uh, and, and we'll kind of, you know, walk you through the process of getting your license key. Once you've uh, gotten a license key, you can, you want to go through and start five machines. So two meta instances and two, or three meta instances and two data instances. And the process for the meta instances, very straightforward, is download the meta instances, <clears throat> uh, download the package, configure the node, start the node, join the node. And then similarly for the data is download the package, configure the nodes, start the nodes, add the nodes. <clears throat> and so we'll see what that looks like in just a moment here. Obviously, if you're using things like Kubernetes uh, or, or Docker Swarm or, or any number of other solutions, uh, this process is a little bit easier. And I believe we even have uh, init scripts uh, that you can just use out of the box to set things up. Though don't quote me on that, I'm not entirely certain. So uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen uh, and we'll go through that process. And share screen. All right. So uh, here I have my uh, instances. Uh, I've got three data, or three meta. So the three over here. Let me increase my font just so everybody can see. All right. Yeah, you might want to do it a little, a little bit, bit more. more. All right. How's that, Chris? Um, it looks tiny for me, so I'm going to ask some someone else to uh, verify. How about now? Yeah, that's All much right. better. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll go through the process for the most part uh, on this screen, and I'll switch over to the other one. Uh, so the first thing that we do is to download the package. You can get those available, the links for that available on our website. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, you want to start the service. So sudo service. Uh, ha, we want to configure the nodes beforehand. Uh, so we're going to go into uh, Etsy influxdb, uh, influxdb metaconf. Uh, and so the main thing here is you just want to assign the host name. You don't have to do this. Uh, you can just use uh, the, the node's IP address if you please. Uh, every node in the cluster must obviously be addressable by all of the other nodes. Uh, you want to have a couple ports open, uh, namely 8091 uh, and 8088 on the uh, meta nodes, and I think there's 8089. Uh, you want to have all of those available on the meta nodes or addressable by each of the other meta nodes in the cluster. Uh, and then you want to set the host name. 
and then you want to set the license key. So in this case, I've got an empty license key, uh, but I happen to have a special version of software that doesn't require me to have the license key. And so <clears throat> uh, once we configured our instance, and again, the, the things you only really need to do are set the host name uh, and the license key or the license path if you want to have a file. Uh, and then you kind of just move move on from, from there. Uh, important thing to keep in mind here is you really don't need a, a whole lot of configuration at this point. So the first thing I'll do is sudo service uh, influx db meta and start. And that's been happening to me all day. Uh, but I can verify that things are indeed running by checking some logs. Do, do, do. There we go. Uh, and we can see things appear to mostly be working uh, and executing, but there's no leader. And so uh, we're going to uh, join the node to the cluster. So to do that, we say influx D influx D CTL uh, join fill the join cluster so we're going to say dash H and we're going to say uh, we're going to do this one here all right so if we do so what I've done here is I've added the meta node to the cluster, uh, and then I can do an influx D CTL show uh, to see the various meta nodes in the cluster. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is uh, start each of the other services. So sudo service influx db meta start and sudo service influx db meta start. And I'm going to do the same exact, uh, I'll, I'll give it a moment to do it for the rest of the uh, meta nodes, or data nodes. So I'm going to add the other data nodes here, or <clears throat> my apologies, meta nodes. And then I can reissue uh, the influx dctl show command. And I can see that uh, all of the meta nodes here are uh, part of the cluster, or at least this node believes that they're all part of the cluster, which means that the other nodes also believe that they are part of the cluster. I can see the version of the software, and I can currently see that there is no data nodes running. So now we're going to move on to a data node. And we're going to do get bigger again, just so everybody can see. And we're going to do uh, bin Etsy and plus DB. All right. And so again, the only thing we need to really touch here is the host name. So just fill it up with something that is addressable uh, from the other nodes. And you want to have the ports 8088 and 8086 available. Uh, and then the next thing you're going to want to do is uh, get a license key and fill this in. You can do it either through an environment variable uh, or uh, by putting it in the configuration file, whichever is easier for you. Once you've done that, uh, we want to start the service, service influx db start. And we'll do the same one here, sudo service influx db start. Uh, and then we're going to go over here, and we're going to uh, add data 1 on 8088. Uh, Oops, we want to add data. So what we're going to say is uh, influx D CTL add data data one eighty eighty eight, and then we're going to do the same thing for data two. And now we can issue an influx D CTL show, and we can see our entire uh, sort of influx DB cluster. So this is great. Uh, the next thing we can do is uh, we want to actually start chronograph. So we're going to say sudo service uh, influx D, uh, chronograph start. Uh, and then I'm going to go actually look at that node in my browser. Oops, 
And uh, chronograph by default runs on 8888. Uh, here we're going to connect to the thing that is actually on localhost, so like it has there. And we'll call this influx1. And uh, there's actually not currently a telegraph running on there, but sure, that's fine. Uh, so from here, I can uh, create some databases. So if I want to, let's see, uh, do some administration, I can, uh, can I communicate with the server? Hmm. Let's see. Oh, it says it was fine. All right. So I just made a database called X. If I want to uh, view that, I can do show databases, and I can see that database. Uh, if I do uh, say use uh, X, I want to say uh, insert you know, uh, my measurement and say you know, uh, value equals 10. And then I can start doing things like show shards, uh, and we can start to see some information here. Uh, particularly, we can see that uh, the database X has two owners, so uh, that's reflected in its uh, retention policy. So if I say show retention policies on X, uh, retention. Done. Uh, that's just because I can't spell or type. If I say show retention policies on X, X being my database, I can see that there is a, database, a retention policy called autogen that has a duration of zero, which is just an alias for infinity, uh, that has a shard group duration of, I want to say, seven days, uh, and that has a replication of two and is currently the default retention policy. So I can see that the, uh, the replication by looking here at the number of owners, which is uh, the number of, that of owners that I have uh, of that shard in my cluster. So as I mentioned previously, we can also do something where we had a singly replicated database. So what we can do in that case is we're going to issue a create database mydb uh, with uh, replication of one. Uh, update. I, for the life of me, cannot type, and I apologize for that. So it's create database mydb with replication one. Uh, and so now if we say use mydb, and we're going to insert some data, let's insert my measurement, and then let's issue that uh, show retention policies on MyDB. And we can see that it's got a replication of one. And now if I issue a show shards, we can see for MyDB, there's just a single owner, uh, which means that that individual shard has, there's one copy of that individual shard in the cluster. Whereas in this case here, there is the shard with shard ID two uh, has two copies of it in the cluster. Uh, one living in uh, each of owners four and five. Uh, if I want to get in and do some other things, I can do some user management. I can do things like create users, say my user, my user with password. And I can ascribe various rules and permissions. Whoops. I wonder why that keeps coming up. Uh, appears that there's something going wrong. I uh, think that there may be a connection issue. It's one of the issues with doing these types of things live. Uh, it says connected. So uh, that's sort of a number of, of the features that uh, we, we have in the clustering. You can obviously do a lot more. Uh, you can do things like uh, create dashboards, you know, ascribe certain roles to certain users and, and you know, to describe the various permissions that they have, which tags and fields they're allowed to see. Uh, for the time being, though, I think that that mostly covers uh, uh, a sort of base demo of Influx Enterprise. And so I'm going to 
to close out of my screen share and uh, then uh, answer any questions that may have come up in the chat. So uh, thank you for your time and I'll, I'll spend some time going through the questions in the chat now. Uh, it looks like it says here, can you talk a bit more about the name resolution requirements, host files or DNS? Uh, docs require host file entities. Uh, you don't need, to, DNS is fine, you don't need uh, uh, host files. Uh, it, you know, uh, the reason why I've, I've done it with Etsy host is just to make things a little bit more simple uh, when you're doing things by hand, uh, just so you don't have to you know, paste IP addresses everywhere. So the next question is, uh, does each of the meta nodes not require the IP and or host name of the other nodes added to uh, the configuration file? Uh, you don't need to do that, yeah. So uh, we, in fact, we actually, a long time ago, we used to have something similar where you needed to have every other node in there. Uh, you don't need that in the configuration file at all. Uh, all you do is there's sort of two commands in uh, influx dctl. Uh, one of them is uh, influx dctl join and the other one is add. Uh, if you are on a node and you want to join another cluster, you can call out to say I'd like to join this cluster and give it a any node in the cluster's uh, address and it will figure everything out from there. Uh, alternatively, you can be on make a request to one of the, the meta nodes and tell it to add a new node to a cluster. So yeah, you do not have to have a complete list of, of everything, of every member uh, in, in a config file anywhere. Uh, in addition to the meta and data nodes, there's a web node. Uh, can this be considered an optional component? Yes, it's 100% an optional component. So uh, the main reason why we see people use Chronograph is uh, it just gives you kind of a nice UI layer for doing things like managing users uh, and, and say, you know, uh, permissions of various things that go on in the database. Uh, so it, it just really, the way we think about it is uh, you have the influx DB cluster, which kind of stands on its own, uh, but there's a number of operations that are, are you know, a little bit sophisticated to get into managing users and roles and permissions. Uh, and, you know, uh, you can do all of that very easily through uh, Chronograph or this, this web node that we were talking about. So it, it's 100% optional. The, one of the benefits, though, is uh, you can get some sort of dashboards right out of the bat for free. But if you're using Grafana or, or anything of that sort, uh, you, you can kind of bypass that. Uh, during your demo, you installed Started Chronograph as a separate component. Uh, during a test installation, it was included uh, in the web console. Uh, any advantages to a separate install? Um, not entirely sure I understand the question during demo. So uh, we previously had another thing called the Enterprise Web or Enterprise Web UI. Uh, you know, due to some sort of issues that we've had with it, we we moved away from it. We haven't 100% retired it yet, but we're very close to it. Uh, and we built the exact same functionality into Chronograph uh, that you can use to sort of do the same kind of user management operations. Um, there, during test installation, it was included in the web console. Oh, perfect. Glad, glad to hear it. So the next question is, how do you add a load balancer for the data nodes? Uh, really, any any load balancer will do. Um, I've, I've seen people roll their own sort of very small proxy in front of, uh, reverse proxy in front of the data nodes, uh, HA proxy or HA proxy or Nginx, really anything, uh, any load balancer is is sufficient. Uh, and typically what we do in our cloud instance is uh, we have a, a service that's pinging each of the uh, data nodes. And if it notices that one of them isn't responding to a ping, it'll actually remove it from the load balancer. 
So there's kind of, it's opaque to you whether or not, like all of your requests should, should mostly be successful. Uh, and hopefully if in the case that one node happens to go, uh, go down. So which cloud provider is your managed service with? Uh, we currently work on AWS uh, is, is what we're, we're built on for our cloud service. You spoke about using Telegraph to monitor your cluster. Are there key metrics that you should be used to track cluster or node health? Uh, great question. Uh, if you use Chronograph and you have Telegraph on each of those nodes and you en enable the InfluxDB plugin, uh, there's sort of pre-built dashboards that uh, will, will come out of the box uh, that will, will track all of that information for you so you don't need to figure out uh, which ones there are. If there's anything sort of custom that you'd like to add in, uh, you can obviously do that. And we're, we're currently working on if you want to throw even capacitor into the mix, you can even get alerts if, you know, one of your nodes happens to be going down. But that that's, you know, still still to come. Uh, are there supported Docker containers for meta and data nodes? Uh, there should be. Uh, I would be surprised if they're not. Let me check uh, in more detail, though. I actually don't know the answer. I'm, I'm fairly certain there are Docker containers for the meta and data nodes. Uh, at the very least, we run we run some we run our, our cloud instances or our cloud hosted versions of it <clears throat> uh, in Docker containers, and we are using it. So, uh, at the very least, they must exist somewhere. Uh, they probably would not be in the docs. Uh, I would highly recommend reaching out to our sales team uh, and they'll be able to assist you with that process of, of where they are. I, I myself actually don't know where they are. Uh, so if you send us an email, we'll put you in touch with our sales team. You know, as part of your trial, we, we can get you a Docker container. <clears throat> Yeah, Mark, I'll go ahead and email you and Lauren to get you guys connected so we can get that moving. Um, I also encourage everyone to put their questions into a community. Um, you know, uh, one of our um, big contributors to the community is Jack Zamplin, and he's a huge uh, Docker fan, and he might actually know that, that, that answer. Yep, Jack, Jack would very likely know that answer. All right, uh, any more questions? Uh, where are cluster log files and what additional information is available uh, comparing to single instance logs? Uh, not entirely sure I understand the question. Uh, so log files, uh, depending on you know what what uh, version of Ubuntu or Red Hat or, or whatever your uh, whatever OS on you're on, <clears throat> you can pull them from journal. <clears throat> uh, sorry, my, my apologies. Throat's uh, acting up here a little bit. Uh, you can pull them from journal D, uh, or uh, I think there's an option where you can specify a log file that you'd like it to be written to. By default, uh, that is var log and plus DBE, and then the name of the service that is running. Um, the thing I don't understand is what uh, additional information is available comparing to single instance logs. Uh, I don't, I don't know what, what do you mean by single instance logs? Ah, yeah, <clears throat> this is a great question is, can you speak to the detail of di about disk requirements, shared storage, SAN, uh, local storage, et cetera, for data nodes? <clears throat> uh, yeah, so so typically uh, we, we require, <clears throat> sorry, uh, we, we prefer local storage uh, uh, if possible. You want to have uh, about 500 to 1,000 IOPS on your, your disk, depending on, you know, what kind of workflow you do. You could end up using a lot less disk. You can end up using a lot more. Uh, we usually don't see things go above a thousand IOPS. Uh, we've seen people try to do network attack storage before, uh, and typically that that ends with a decent amount of sadness. 
But if you want to, you know, run on EBS volumes, we, we that that's usually fine. We don't see any issues there, uh, provided that the IOPS are are in some kind of reasonable range. Uh, does that answer your question sufficiently? To give maybe even a little bit more detail, you know, how big should the disk be? Uh, yeah, local storage is an ideal for production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of, of course. So, but, you know, have an EBS volume uh, is for SANS, yeah. Best practices for SANS. Uh, what do you mean by best practices? I, I, I maybe am not familiar enough to speak intelligently about this. Do you need high read writes? So uh, typically we see about 500 IOPS is, is where things uh, hang out. We really don't do any testing on specific types of disk formats, uh, though we have, we've sort of been moving in that, that direction. Uh, typically it's, it's a, <clears throat> typically you have uh, the, Initial sort of append only that goes onto a wall, uh, and that should be read optimized. Or sorry, write optimized, and then uh, things where things are coming from queries. So that's the data directory. You want to do something that is is read optimized. Uh, we haven't done specific things around you know what what would be best. Uh, if you email in, we can get you a bit more information with somebody that, that knows a bit more about uh, you know sort of some disk things. This is really outside of the my my realm of expertise. Uh, so definitely email in or ask that on community and we can get, uh, get you a better answer for, for that. Yeah, I, I agree. We, the main reason why it's, it's probably been a light, uh, relatively light is we, we haven't done a whole lot of uh, intensive testing, uh, around and that ourselves. Perfect. Uh, so the other question is how are CQ workloads distributed among the data nodes? Uh, so this is a great question. Uh, at any one time, one data node will be answering all of the continuous queries. Uh, this is not necessarily ideal. So if you have a very high continuous query workload, uh, it, it is a little bit, uh, it can put a lot of excess no load on an instance. So if you do have a high CQ workload, you have a lot of data on sampling, we highly recommend using capacitor. So capacitor, you can translate continuous queries directly to capacitor tasks. Uh, you can uh, do it in either a batch or a stream mode. So if you're doing stream, it'll take even more load off of InfluxDB. If you're doing batch, uh, it will still place that load on InfluxDB, but you can use it kind of, uh, the load will be spread across the nodes a little bit more. Uh, hopefully that is a sufficient answer. So another question is, can nodes uh, slash clusters be configured to send alerts when something is wrong, like load disk space or cluster error, et cetera? Uh, yes, they can. Uh, currently, that would require a little bit more external tooling. Uh, you could you know, use capacitor uh, in that uh, separate monitoring cluster or, or monitoring instance that we talked about to do it. Uh, it's entirely something you, you could do. Uh, we're working on trying to get to a place where you can just get that out of the box without having to do a bunch of extra uh, configuration and, and work yourself. Uh, so the final question is, do you guys offer training courses on Influx in general? Uh, yes, we do. So there's, there's sort of two ways that we can go about that. 
Uh, we have these webinars or our trainings, you know, uh, I believe every week, maybe even twice a week, uh, where we cover some, you know, uh, various topics. But if you'd like more in depth, uh, more, you know, focus to you or more interaction, uh, we also do professional services, training engagements, where uh, more likely than not, uh, I will be hanging out with you for uh, a number of hours and we'll kind of go through. Uh, all of the components of influx data or whichever ones are particularly interesting to you and we'll, we'll cover sort of everything about time series. So uh, we have the ones that we offer for free and then we have uh, professional services engagements that we can do either in person or uh, online, uh, whichever is, is sort of preferable to you. I'm sure Chris can even speak to this uh, more than I can. Yeah, Mark, great question. So we have a um, uh... Let me just pull the link on our website. So we have um, a, a getting started series, which is seven um, webinars that we put on. And um, as um, let me just pull this up for you guys. And it starts just right for the beginning. You know, what is um, time series um, all the way to some more a lot more advanced topics. And um, what we do is we try to rotate through the uh, getting started series. Of, um, it's about, you know, over the course of a couple of months, and then we insert some uh, newer topics that people ask us to cover. Um, so we get we get into some details, really advanced details about capacitor. We just did one on writing a telegraph plugin, and all the videos are listed at that URL that I just um, gave to everybody. And if there are other topics that you want, just shoot me an email, and um, we're always happy to um, to add those in there. All right, great uh, session. Thank, we really love it when people have a lot of questions. Uh, if we didn't get your um, question answered properly, uh, please uh, go into our community site and post your questions there. And uh, there's a whole host of people that will um, be sure to answer questions, especially about the questions about, um, about Docker and also storage. We can probably get those answered, um, uh, even though we don't have the appropriate documentation uh, just yet. I will post this uh, webinar before the end of the day and um, join us again next week. And uh, we have um, we always have a webinar on Tuesday and a training on Thursday. And then I always post them on our website uh, for everyone to take a, a, another listen to at, um, at their convenience. So thanks again, Michael. It's always awesome to have you. And thanks everybody Thank you. for your really great questions. And we will see you again soon. Bye-bye.